And we're back, and it's been a while since I put a new episode out, and I thought I'd share some insights into how the new mesh system works, or some of the new mesh tools, I should say, in QGIS work. Mesh has been around in QGIS for a while already, but there's been some nice tools added in the upcoming release of 3.16. So what I thought I would do is actually do a bit of a workflow run through in the session and um, I'm going to open up QGIS, I'm going to add some contours, I'm going to extract elevation points from the contours and then I'm going to build a mesh from those elevation points and then I'm going to sort of flip it around in 3D and look at how we could overlay other data and just talk about some of the uh, pros and cons of mesh data and uh, working with mesh and uh, how to visualize it in 3D nicely. So that's the plan. I'm doing this totally on the fly, off the cuff. I've kind of got a plan but I um, most likely will run into some issues along the way and I'm just going to take you along for the ride and we'll see how we get on. So I'm going to start by adding a contour data set to, um, to my project and I've got this five meter contours for Cape Town so I'm going to be using those as the basis for the work. Now if I use this whole data set uh, it's probably going to be overly dense and um, it's going to take a long time to demo it and so on. I've actually run this analysis before today and when I extracted the vertices out in the method, method that I'm going to be showing you I landed up with 25 million vertices and um, some other parts of the workflow weren't really well suited to deal with that bigger data set. So what I'm going to do rather is I'm going to be going into Cape Town and pulling out um, pulling out just a small piece of the data set here. So I'm just going to use my trusty oh, oh, QGIS's trusty XYZ layer support here. I've got a bunch of different uh, tiling layers that I can add in. I'm just going to grab one at random because um, I'm a nice guy, I'll take one of the um, open street map ones. Let's see if I can find an open, there we go, open street map and put it in there because it's nice to use open data. All right, and then um, that's just to give me a bit of, you know, make sure that I'm looking at the right place. So you can see there's Cape Town. This is Table Mountain, it's a very famous mountain. We've got Signal Hill and Lion's Head, Table Mountain and Devil's Peak here. So what I want to try to do is like kind of pull this section out of the contour data set and uh, leave off the rest and then um, turn that into a bit of a model. So let's just go and flip this around there so that's on top. So there's many ways you can do this. I'm going to do the most simple, quick and easy way that I can think of which is just to select kind of up to there like that. Um, you'll see it's selected rather more than I, than I um, chose the mouse because it's gone obviously outside the extent but um, I just want to actually zoom out turn this off and just see how much more I actually got than I intended so I th think some of those contours are really they wrap around the whole mountain there but I think that's fine I'll, I'll, I'll clip it again I think once I've turned it into points maybe and then just get rid of some of the excess so that's my first uh, pass cut I'm going to make a working folder that I can just put all my work products into. That's also a nice um, thing to do. So just go, um, I'll call that mesh demo, and I'm going to just save these out into uh, a geo package. Let's do so export, save features, save selected features as. I'm careful to choose that one because I only want the yellow lines there. I don't care about a lot of this stuff here, so I do care about the contour because the contour's actually got the the line height in it, which I want. Um, I'm going to go make a new um, uh, geo package in here. Mesh demo. There we go. Mesh demo. All right, and. Now I could do, try to do some more clipping things using this but I think for now I'll just uh, stick with it like it is now and then I'm going to keep my workspace clean I'm going to get rid of the original data set I can see that there's a bunch of stuff there that I don't want 
Um, I could go and do some fancy things, clipping layers and clipping things out and whatever, using tools to do that. But honestly, I think it's going to be quicker if I just turn these into the point layer first and then deal with it afterwards. So I want to do like a densification of the vertices here. Um, and there's different ways that I can do it. So let me go rather in the processing toolbox and look for, um, uh, like we could do some things like uh, line density like this. Um, um, no, that's not the right one. Um, so I'm going to maybe just put a node. Let's see what we get. Uh, densify by interval. Okay, that's exactly what I want. I want to add more nodes along the length of the line. Um, my data is in this unknown CRS, which is Cape Town's uh, or South Africa's ELO coordinate system. I'm going to convert the data to a different format as well along the way because um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I, it's going to be a bit complicated later. I'm going to put it into just uh, Google Earth, uh, Google Mercator, whatever they call it, um, spherical Mercator projection later. So let's put the interval here to, now before I did 10 meters then I got a lot of vertices, so I'm going to do maybe 25 meters just to keep it not too big. And I'm going to put the outputs into my same geo package here and I'm going to call it um, uh, dense contours, how's that, all right. And let's run. Let's run it. Now, I like keeping my um, system monitor running while I'm doing stuff. I can see how hard my computer is working, but actually um, it was pretty quick. It's already run it, so that's great. Now I've got a new layer added here, and um, I want to just verify that it's actually done what I think it's doing. So I'm going to zoom in here, and I'm just going to use a bit of a cartography trick to show me um, a marker on every vertex on the line. And I'll do that for both the original line and the new line layer and see if there's a difference. So to do that, we're going to go here. We're going to say simple line, no. Or I'll just add another symbol layer like this. And this simple layer, uh, symbol layer is going to be a marker line. And I'm going to say on every vertex. And um, I just want to choose something a little bit less busy like that maybe and can be just one doesn't have to be so big okay right now i can copy that style um to the other one here like this all right so they both got the same style so in theory if i zoom in i'm just going to change the color of the second one so i can see them sort of uh juxtaposed against each other so let's make this one bright red okay so if I zoom in I would expect to see that there are some black markers where there are no red markers so um, now it's actually a bit hard to see I'm going to go back with the back to the um, blob <laughs> marker rather because I think it can be easier to see something there. So there's red markers there and then this one here, let's go make them uh, maybe triangles and we make them green or something like that just so that we can see them with a different color. Um, no, no pen for the stroke. Okay, so I can see actually green markers and I'm not seeing quite what I expected to see. I expected to see new contours unless the space between these is already less than 15 meters. So let's go check that. Um, all right, so that's only three meters apart. So that makes sense. And then that's why I'm not seeing more vertices added there. So let's go and zoom out a bit and see if we can find somewhere where there's a long straight bit of contour. Um, see, I'm just going to zoom to everything again. Let's go. You can see predominantly green, um, but that's just because the green layer is on top, so it's not really telling me anything. I'm going to find a long straight contour. Maybe I don't have any long straight contours and it's already dense enough. 
I'm sort of seeing a few places here, but they all look actually equally dense. Alright, so I think we don't actually need to do that densified um, data set because the vertices are sufficiently dense here. And I'll go straight on to the next step. So what I want to do next, but this technique that I've shown you would have been good if you had contours which were kind of with long intervals or you wanted to make it more dense. You could have done them three meters apart and you would have you know, dense, densified your contour data set. So yeah, so let's jump onto the next part. I'm going to take this and I'm going to pull out the contours. Uh, I'm going to pull out the sorry the vertices from that. So go back to here and um, you see there's a vert extract vertices here. Um, and so we look there. So give it the input layer, and then we give it an output layer. Um, Um, elevation points would be a nice descriptive name. Alright, and uh, let's run that. Close, and now I've got a new data set. Uh, I should have had a new da data set. Oh, it's still busy running. I'll just give it a second to Figure that part out. Clean up my project while I wait for that. I'm just going to save my work. Mesh demo. Okay. I'm not sure why it's taking so long because it was pretty quick um, exporting the contours across to the geo package. Sometimes you just got to be patient. You want everything to happen instantly on the computer, but some things just take a while. Okay, I'm going to go and um, give in to my impatience and see if it's actually made that layer already. So it didn't make the layer yet. If it had made the layer, then it would have prompted me which layer from the geo package did I want to load. Just gonna have a little look in our geo package, see what's happening in there. Okay, we've only got the one layer so far. No, I think it should have been finished already, so I think that something might have gone wrong. Um I can't see why it would take so long. So let's try to kill it. Will it let me kill it? I think it's actually... Oh yeah, it's killed it. Okay, so let's try again. Let's go. Let's... Uh, see, it actually wrote this layer into a different place into a different geo package so uh, you have to be careful and look carefully where things are being written to because otherwise it takes your old old folder and uh, causes confusion so let's go back to this browser here and just add the mesh demo back here we know that that's already got the sort of dense um, vertices in it Let's try again with this tool, extract vertices, mesh demos, what do you want to take it from? I'm just going to write it to another G 
geo package. Niall Dawson has been writing um, on the mailing list saying how much he hates GeoPackage at the moment. Not in, in because of the concept of GeoPackage, I think it's a great concept, just because of some technical issues that make life a bit hard. But um, it's still pretty convenient for just doing this kind of stuff. Um, okay, let's give it another go and see if it does a better job this time. You can actually see the um, the command that it's using. Oh, you can see the data set layer and names that it's using. But come on, you can do it. Another thing you can do is watch the file sizes in that folder and see uh, if they're growing all the time. So there's the geo package there. It seemed to get stuck. Oh okay, no, it's still going, it's still going. CPUs doing anything interesting? Nope. I think it's just um, bottlenecking on disk speed. I guess I don't know why it's taking so long. Maybe it's just got to get a lot, get through a lot of um, data. Okay, when it finishes then we're going to go and um, select just the just the points around that part of the mountain that we're interested in. And we, I'm going to check to see if there's a Z value on those points. Uh, hopefully it's been brought in from the um, attribute anyway. Either one is fine. So when I say um, brought in from the attributes, the original contour data set has an attribute which is the height value of that contour. So if it's got that attribute or if it's got a Z value on the geometry, then we've got a way to tell the mesh creation tool what, like where to get the heights from, from, from the points. Let's see if our file's growing at all. It should suddenly jump in size once the operation is done there. Woohoo, okay, great. Let's see, did it update? There we go, 408 megabytes now. So we know it's written a chunk of data in there. I always like to just save my project every time I move the needle one step forward. Um, okay, so we've got the elevation points, and if we look at how many elevation points we had, if we're feeling brave, we could do this, and it's going to count how many features in that layer. It says zero, that can't be right. Um, so it's having a bit of a brain wobble, or it's still counting, <laughs> but. Um, Let's do it like this. Um, we can use a tool like th this one here to go and open our database. Let me 
HTML, that's the one there, and then we can look at the tables and we can see elevation points there. And we can say select count. This is a nice thing about having a geo package, you basically got a little SQL database at your fingertips. Um, from elevation points. Alright, let's run that and we get okay three hundred thousand basically three hundred and one uh, th three hundred and one thousand oh no hang on <laughs> three million three million one hundred thousand okay three million is more points than we want to deal with uh, so we're going to go and prune that down a bit so let's go zoom out a bit um, like I said, I only, only care about this area here, so it's pretty simple. We can just now select all the points from that layer um, using the rectangular selection tool here. I'm just going to let them draw in just so that um, QGIS is kind of like finished doing its thing before I get started with the selection. So I'm just going to select across like two over here. Hopefully that will prune it down a bit. Now, it would be nice actually to have the map slightly rotated before we do the selection. So let me actually just do that. Let's um, rotate it a little bit like that. Because the mountain is kind of like a bowl over here. And I want to select them square across there. So let's see if that's going to help us do a square selection like that. Yeah, okay, cool. In fact, I'm going to be even more conservative about my selection area and just go like this. Alrighty. Ready, QGIS? Okay. So, now we're going to write this out to another geo package, which is going to be just the table mountain one. I've left a little chunk of the corner there, but for the purposes of this demo, uh, it's not too important. So, okay, it's having a bit of a think, trying to select all that, all those data sets, which if we had, what did I say, 3,100,000 points originally, hopefully we're printing it down to like 100,000, but it could be a bit more. So it's got to work through that while it selects it. Okay, here we go. And now I can go right click here. I'm not going to bother to wait for it to finish drawing. Export, save selected features at. Now I don't want all this extra stuff here, so I'm just going to I'm going to keep the contour. I don't need all this extra stuff. I want to keep it nice and simple. All right, I'm going to put it in the geo package again. I'm going to make just another one. Um, let's call it Table Mountain. Table, mountain. I know I could write extra layers in the same geo package, but just to keep things sort of separate, I'm putting them each one in their own geo package. I'm going to also reproject at the same time here because I want to put it into Google Mercator. Or, sorry, I still call it Google Mercator, pseudo Mercator. It used to be called colloquially Google Mercator. Okay, and let's write that out. And it's busy writing along the bottom here. Hopefully that goes a bit quicker. Now I should explain that I'm my target is to get it to sort of well below a million points. And Martin Dobiesch from Lutra uh, was sort of. Uh, giving me some advice on how to work with Mesh and he said that most video cards, graphics cards, um, which are more on the low end side, which mine is, um, have, you know, well they, they will top out their memory if you if you try to load a, vesh, a Mesh in the 3D viewer in QGIS. Um, and he said like mostly if you're under a million vertices you should be alright for, for lower end cards. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to just get enough that I can load the whole scene in memory in QGIS without topping out the video card memory. I've got a little indicator here showing my video card working. 
this is mainly just because of the screen recording software I'm using that it's working so hard now. Unfortunately, it doesn't show the GPU memory. That would be nice. Then we could actually see how much has been taken up. Okay, so let's hide that away and that away. And now we've got just the points from that box there. And um, let's go do our trick with the SQL man again. Uh, SQLite manager and we're going to open uh, that new database we made which was table mountain elevation points select count from let's see if I call it the same thing okay of course I gave it a huge long name just to make my typing a challenge um, Table mountain elevation points. Okay. Let's see how many we've got now. We've got just over a million. One million and twenty thousand. Let's see how we get on with that. I might come back and chop that down some more if it's uh, too big. Um, so. Clear out all the stuff we don't care about here. All right, and save my project. Let's have a go at turning that into a mesh. So, if you type in the quick search at the bottom here, mesh, you'll see the new tool that's available in QGIS 3.16, thanks to Vincent Clorick from Guadeloupe, um, who's obviously a genius to build this stuff. I know he also used work from Marco Hugentobler's original interpolation um, library that he that he added to QGIS years ago. Um, so with this tool, I can come along and choose my contour, which is the the height of each, uh, you know, the attribute for the height of each point. And I choose the layer and I add it to this list. Now you could add more layers to this list to create break lines. These are, we should say, our vertices. So break lines will make sure that your your mesh triangles or polygons don't um, cover those break lines. They will, like for example, if you have a road, uh, we'll make sure that there's not a, uh, a road that's like halfway along a slope. It will like split the, split the adjacent polygons so that the road is an edge of those um, polygons. Now the formats at the moment, I've got 2DM and cellophane. There's a third format that's supported that you may well see, um, but there's some missing libraries on my system, so because um, the missing one uses NetCDF as a storage. Um, so I'm going to be using 2DM. You should note that cellophane won't let you make a 3D visualizable mesh in QGIS. Um, and the 2DM has its own issues. It doesn't allow you to store the projection with uh, um, in the metadata of the file. So even though I'm choosing uh, Google Mercator here for the output um, or, or pseudo Mercator, um, it's, it's going to forget that as soon as I've done it. But that's OK. We'll deal with that just now. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say this is my uh, mesh. 2dm. The 2dm format doesn't require that you say um, use this extension, but just for myself that I can remember it. And I'm going to run that. And um, it's pretty fast dealing with a million vertices. Um, hopefully, my computer is working really hard. Only on one thread. Um, it's actually doing all that processing just on the one core of the CPU, and the other 20. Th three are having a pretty lonely time, nothing to do. Um, let's see how it gets on. Why is the first 80% always so much faster than the last 20%? While it's busy running, I think I'm just going to do some clean up here. So I had all these intermediate data sets. I landed up with the table mountain points. 
but before that I had these elevation points which I don't need so I'm going to get rid of those and um, this has got the contours, the original contours um, I might be keeping those around a bit because I um, I want to drape them onto the top of the map later maybe so I'll hang on to those All right. So while I'm waiting for that, I should maybe also mention a couple of other things. So the the one of the nice things about the mesh is that and let me see if I can pull up um, pull up a tweet from our dear friend Saba from Lutra Consulting, who had a nice diagram here. I'll just search for him here. Um, So he posted some nice diagrams showing mesh things. Um, yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. So this is just to show you that uh, typically if you deal with an elevation model, you're going to have the data arranged in a regular grid like this. Now mesh can also be arranged in a regular grid, or you can have it arranged with tie, uh, triangles, and other shape polygons to format uh, the mesh. And what's nice is that when your data is dense, like um, in a in a canyon, for example, and you've got a lot of vertices with height change indicating height changes, you can have a lot of small triangles basically. And when the data is sparse, you can have big polygons which represent those sparsely populated areas. And so, it can be good at variable density data representing variable density data. So um, that's the one thing to bear in mind. It can also potentially take up a lot more space. And then I believe, again, I'm not an expert on, on mesh data, but that you can also, in QGIS, you can have uh, this, mesh, this mesh, but at different temporal or other um, uh, intervals in the same file. So you could have, for example, uh, let's say we're looking at water um, levels, you could have the same file depicting a flood at level 1 and then at level 2 um, so and they sort of overlays on top of each other. And you can also attach attributes to the to the edges and the vertices and the faces as I understand it. So that gives you some interesting options for um, you know advanced cartography and, and symbolization and things like that. So um, uh, Vincent Clorick, Clorick um, shared this nice diagram with me earlier just showing something that they developed at Lutra with flood modeling and using mesh and you can see you can make really beautiful visualizations using the same data format. And these arrows along here are also part of the mesh capabilities that QGIS has um, again added by Lutra. Alright let's see how processing is getting on. Last step. I'm going to step away from the mic for a minute while it does the last bit and then uh, I'll be back in a second. Okay, good. So now we should have a mesh layer. So let's hide the other things and see what our mesh looks like. I believe QGIS is about to crash. Maybe not. Let's see. I should have more confidence in it. There we go. Um, it looks suspiciously empty. So why is that? Let's try to zoom to it. I'm going to first, um, as I mentioned, it doesn't remember the coordinate reference system, so I'm going to just go and define this quickly as pseudo mercator, and I'm going to just try to zoom to it and see. Um, 
It's taking a very long time to low or to respond. So, because I'm using a home built one, I can just check quickly to see if it's busy in the throes of crashing. Looks like Geo Package is having some kind of a wobble over deleting something. Um, let's try to just. Uh, I'm just going to kill it and then start again. Let's see, maybe. Oh, wait, wait. I must just be more patient. Okay, let's try and add that mesh. And so we go back to our folder. Here's our mesh. So that weighed in at 337 megabytes. The point data set was 100 megabytes. So we've basically created a four-fold increase, three and a half-fold increase uh, um, on in size. And it's really struggling to draw that, I think. So maybe that's just too much, too big a mesh. And Vincent was recommending that we use it for smaller areas um, or to use that other format that I don't have support for at the moment. Let's just see if our CPU is doing anything interesting. Okay, so one CPU is burning up trying to render that or load that. Now I don't know of any tools yet that will let you clip the mesh. So if you decide your mesh is too big at the moment, what I'm doing is just going back and um, reducing the size of the point set that I used to create the mesh and then trying again. It's already showing me mesh. Oh, there, it's got the mesh loaded. I just can't see anything here. Okay, there we go. It managed in the end. Now, I think I'm just going to put the XYZ tile in the background again for um, OpenStreetMap. I think what's happened is that it's uh, there was some stray data in my data set. Because remember I clipped it to a nice little box. Um, so, and it also does not seem to have any spatial relation to um, OpenStreetMap data. So let's have a look at this. Okay, there's Cape Town, and let's go to here and put this to that. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. All right, so it still went crazy and went up the coast and down the coast. So I must have had some stray data somewhere that that caused it, or the extent was still set to something there. I'm, I'm not sure. But um, let's give it a go anyway and see how if it will come up in a 3D model. That's what, I, what I'm interested in. Um, Let's just go like this. It's really very slow to respond. I feel like I've done the whole data set and not just Table Mountain. I think that's what's happened. So I must have slipped up and I'm going to go back and try again. Let's go in there and have a look. Because it should be just giving me this part here. I can see it's running all the way down there. Right, so you can't really tell it's a mesh yet, but if you change the cartography, the symbology for the layer a bit, you'll start to see why it's a mesh and not um, a raster. So if we go like this and maybe turn off this one here, you can see all those triangles that I was talking about coming in there. And there's a lot of them, so it's not so easy to make out what's going on. And basically the whole terrain is now defined. You can see these are the contour lines themselves and then they've sort of been joined together like this. Um, one trick that I didn't know, which I found out yesterday, is if you want to enable this contour view again, you've got to go back to here, to general, to the bed elevation and enable it over here by clicking on this little icon. Otherwise, um, it sort of stays, uh, th this button, you know, this tick box becomes unavailable to you. All right, so let's try to see. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to throw this away. I'm so sorry. You're a lovely mesh. It was nice to have you for a while, but I want to get those points back on here and make sure I'm using the right point data set. So let's go back here, put those on, and just zoom out a tad. Okay, 
I just want to make sure I really just have just that box. Remember I rotated the map, that's why the box is at, a, at an angle like that. Okay. So I must have chosen the wrong data set when I generated. That's my bad, and I will redo it again. Practice makes perfect, eh? So here we go. So table mountain elevation points, and okay, now I've got another problem is that I didn't carry out the contour um, attribute. So that's two issues, and that means I've got to go delete that or remove that and go back to um, here and okay, those are the original contours. Now we're going to be digging in the wastebasket because I think I threw those original elevation points away. Let's have a look here. Uh, let's go back there. Okay, so that's all the points. So let's clean up the mess now. So we get rid of that. Um, we're going to get rid of this one because that was the wrong thing. Um, then we're going to do our map rotation. So I'm just going to press escape so I don't have to wait for that whole thing to draw. And then I'm going to rotate the map a bit. Wrong way. All right, and then um, I'm going to make a selection, just this area here. I'm even going to go just in a little bit here. All right, and we'll wait for that to select. then we can export the selection. So let's go here. I'm going to be a little bit more careful this time to make sure I don't make the same mistake twice. So I don't want that. I do want that. I don't want any of those. Um, I'm going to save it as a geo package. I'm going to call it table Mountain elevation points, and where I slipped up last time is I didn't call that a shorter name, so let's just call that elevation points, and we're going to be putting it into Google's or well, into pseudo Mercator. I'm sorry, I keep calling it Google Mercator. One day I'll lose the habit, but for now I'm stuck with it. So. Um, I don't know, let's go put it out like that, right? See what happens. Um, all right. Okay, that was a bad call on my part, trying to call the feature ID and the ID the same thing. Let's try again. Export selected features as. Um, Good. Okay, let's try again. Now, Geo Package format does not allow you to overwrite a layer. So, even though Q just offers you this option here, you can't do it. So, I'm going to just change the name to, um, I'll just call it height points. Oh, you know what, I'm going to put it into a different geo package. Um, I'm just going to call it
Um, okay, and then we'll try again. It was pretty quick building the mesh for the whole data set, considering how much, I think I said it was 3.1 million vertices that it built that mesh from, so it's quite impressive performance. And hopefully it'll be much quicker now with the smaller data set, when I, if I've done everything right. Again, I'm going to do some housekeeping here because I've got this elevation points. Uh, I've got this one here. Um, I'm not even sure if I wrote it into the right directory now. Let's see where it went. If you're not sure where a th thing went, you can just hold your mouse on it and it will show you that it's mesh, mesh data table mountain elevation points 2.geo package. There you go, there's number two. Second time's the charm. So I'm just going to go in here and just zoom in and click on one point and just double check that I've got a um, uh, that I've got a proper elevation for each vertex. So just go in here and then just take the identify tool and we'll click on anyone and we have a look and see. So you can see here we've got the contour which is 190. That's the altitude basically for that point. That's perfect. That's what we want. So I don't need this one anymore. All right. And I know that I need the table mountain elevation, uh, table mountain two. I don't need that one. So I can put that in the waste basket as well. And then um, let's try again. Let's run the mesh analysis here. All the same steps. So I'm going to go select my table mountain two elevation points. I'm going to choose the contour as the height, the value in the vertex. I'm going to make sure that these are vertices. They are. I'm going to choose the 2DM format, pseudo mercator for the output CRS. All right, and then we're going to call this mesh 2, or let's call it table mountain. Table mountain mesh 2dm. All right, let's see if it does it a bit faster this time. I didn't count how many vertices um, in this data set, but um, I'm going to have a look in a second. I'm going to be um, having an ask me anything with with Vincent Cloric and maybe uh, Belgesim Nejima, who are the developers of a lot of this 3D stuff. Um, Belgesim's been on the Google Sum of Code program developing a lot of nice 3D functionality in QGIS. So I'm planning to do that. Well, I haven't told Belgesim yet, but Vincent has agreed to come um, in the QGIS Quack Friday um, event in November, not this one happening on the 30th of October, but the one in November. So if you want to see more about what you can do with meshes and 3D, come along to that. We'll stream it on YouTube and um, uh, announce it on Twitter and all those kind of things. All right, so it's made the mesh. Now we've got the problem with the coordinate reference system. It's still not right, so we're going to go in here and tell it to use the right coordinate reference system. That's shown up in the right place on the map. It looks suspiciously, um, what's the word? Purple. <laughs> Let's see. 
Why it's so purple? Maybe I've done something wrong again. That's also possible, although there's some little bit of color coming in from the edges there. Oopsie. Oh yeah, it's because I was very zoomed in. That makes sense. Okay, perfect. Just give it a chance to catch up to me. There we go. So there's a nice model uh, clip to our area. The reason that's cut off is because there was no data outside of that um, little segment there. And, um, you know, same things apply. We can go and see the actual mesh here. Um, probably best to zoom in when you're doing that because it's got to draw a lot of little triangles. All right, beautiful. Let's see if it can manage to make a 3D map from this. Now, it's probably still a bit big. I actually, just for curiosity's sake, want to go and see how many vertices we have in our data set. Um, totally forget, forgot where we were. <laughs> So Table Mountain elevation points two. Right, let's see what we got. Okay, we're under the magic one million mark just by a hair. So we've got ninety six uh, and 969,000 uh, vertices in that data set, which is great. Let's see if it will manage. So we're going to go here and we're going to go 3D map view. Now again, what I'm about to show you is mostly only going to work in QGIS 3.16. So uh, this capability was not available in 3.14 and before. So I'm telling it to use the mesh as the vertical, um, the source for, for vertic uh, vertical elevation data in the 3D model. And um, let's have a look if it manages. Now, it's probably just out of the view frame. I'm going to go like this. Sometimes I get a crash when I do this. So let's just save out our work as well here. Let's try to zoom in there. To figure out how to find it. I think it's having a bit of a hard time drawing it, but I um, also think that it's probably just outside my view frame and I can't see it. So, what I'm going to do is um, just try quickly. Ah, I also did an error there. I forgot to choose the, the, the tin. Let's try again. Just going to give it a second. I want to go and look and see if my CPU is working hard, not doing a thing. And the GPU, it's also not doing anything. So, I just can't see anything. So, let's go try and put this in 3D rendering mode here. Aha, there we go. Okay, now let's see if we can make head or tail of that. All right, so it's a little bit strange because I'm just trying to make. Okay, there we go. Normally you look at Table Mountain, it's sort of a bowl, so there's the Table Mountain part and then. There's a uh, lion's head, signal hill, and devil's peak over here. Let's just zoom in a bit more. So we're now throwing around more or less a million vertices in our in our 3D view here, and it's doing a pretty good job of it. Um, and then we can start to play. We can start to play with with the lighting and um, uh, all sorts of things. So. I'm going to spend a few minutes quickly doing that. I'm just going to save my project. Um, I want to zoom in a bit more and just show you the kind of detail that you get in a mesh, which you just don't get in a in a um, in an elevation model. 
the main thing is that because the the vert the you, you don't get the st stair step effect from a from a digital elevation model because where the data is dense um, you just pack in more triangles and so you can represent all these small sort of nuances in the terrain so I'm trying to just sort of um, pan around Table Mountain as its name suggests is a very flat top mountain so that is not a data artifact that's actually how the table uh, how the mountain top is um, that looks pretty awesome right it's very green so <laughs> let's make it not so green first of all um, I want to just turn that off again and see if it sticks around in the view like this because actually what happens is that the 3D view draws um, the mountain twice in a way. It draws it once because we set the mountain as the elevation for the for this uh, view and it puts shading onto that elevation map regardless of any layers that may be additionally added on. And then if I come in here and I enable 3D renderer then it also draws this mountain again using this like the, the layer rendering. So just to show you that a little bit if you go in here and um, let's choose uh, think over here you see at the moment it's set to single color let's go back to here it's kind of got the uh, this green look let's make it a an orangey looking thing and let's see if the map updates I mean that the the 3d view yeah so we get the orangey look from there if we go to this 3d thing here and we put on like let's draw the wireframes on um, and we keep the rest like that yeah? and we press apply now there's a bit of a bug in the 3d renderer so I've got to go like just basically open and close this again for it to kind of update itself I think and then we should start seeing the mesh um, uh, maybe we're going to choose a few options here rendering style mesh color let's go let's go I don't know there we go now we can start to see the mesh drawing so um, where's white let's go there and let's make the mesh very thin well, I guess it's in pixels already so it's not going to get much narrower than one pixel Um, what we can do is just zoom in a bit more so you can see a bit more detail. So it's lovely, you can see all those triangles that basically make up the terrain shape. Um, right, so that's not probably something you're going to want to be looking at all the time. We're going to be more wanting to uh, render it here with 2D color ramp. So what this does is it takes the 2D color symbology that you've got set up for the layer which at the moment is this color ramp here and then it applies it to the 3D all right in case that's not obvious in the beginning so let's go and zoom out a bit and see all right so it's already looking much prettier now um, because it's taking all this this color scheme from here on this color ramp to draw it nice okay um, and then I'm going to sort of wrap up because I've got to finish my work day here but um, I just wanted to show putting some data on the top of it and mention some caveats there you can actually I think see the road going over here um, in the elevation model I just want to fly around a bit more because I just so enjoy flying around the 3D models. It's it's so nice to do, and just the quality of the model it, it, with this mesh. It just uh, I just love how beautifully um, it, it how beautifully uh, representative representative it is to the actual landscape. I always find the the dim models are always unless you've got a super high res dim, they always look a bit um, generalized. Okay, there are a whole lot of other things we could be doing with lighting and so on. I'm going to just try to show you one example. That this is the stuff that um, uh, Belgesem has done with the 
with lighting support in 3D now. So I might I might crash and burn, but let's have a quick try here. So if you scroll down, and this user interface definitely needs some some love, but for now anyway, it is like it is. So you can see that the the light, the ambient light that's used, or the or the the main light that's used on the scene is this point light over here. And then you can also set up directional lights. So I'm going to create a new one here. And um, I'll first just make it um, kind of a yellowish tinge. And the tricky part is now figuring out what these values should be. So um, I'm going to put it like that. And uh, you can see that this yellowish tinge has been given to the scene. Now, if you want to try to figure out where is that light coming from, you can go in over here, scroll right down to the bottom, and there's an option here to show the light sources. Okay. And then you look around for a little... Um, there you go. You see that little dot there. So that little, little thing is the light itself. And you notice the whole scene's gone yellow. That's a bit of a bug in this... Um, in the 3D rendering of um, of the layer, I guess it will be fixed in time. But um, at the moment, it so, sort of sometimes forgets um, the cartography rules for for the 3D layer. And the, the fix I found for it is usually just to open and close the options here again, and then it reapplies the the layer settings. Okay, so let's go and see if we can play with our camera. But I want to shine a very bright light now. I can't actually see which direction it's pointing very well. I think I might have, yeah. Let's see if I can get in. It's um, it's just kind of a little bit unresponsive to me scrolling around, so I'm just trying to get it to behave better, yeah? Okay, there we go. So which direction is this light pointing? Let's try and spin the thing around a bit. And I'm going to go just uh, play with the settings a bit here to see what happens if we do different things. So let's make it much more intense. I think one is the max here. And um, um, yep, I'm just going to go here and just make it maybe a blue light so I can just see compared to the other one which one I've got here. Okay, so it's basically flooding the whole scene with the light. So I want to make it more pointed and like imagine if you imagine a cone coming off it, I want to see if I can do like make it a narrower cone coming off the light. Let's just go down here and see if there's any options to do that. Um, so I, perhaps we need to be using a point light instead of this one here. So let's go over here. I remember that I've got 0 and then minus 10 and then 0 to put that in the middle of the scene. So I'll get rid of that one and I'm going to add another point light and see. So we did minus 10 here. Okay, and we're going to use a blue as well just so that we can see which one is our light. Let's see what that does. Okay, so there's our new light. There's the blue tinge coming off the bottom, and um, it's not having such a big effect as the previous one, I think. So let's see if it's. You've got this attenuation things here. So if I go look at light number two versus light number one, I see the light number one's attenuation first factor is very low, so I'm going to put this one too low as well. Um, and I might try and take this downstairs a notch or two. So let's take that to minus five. Oh, okay. So you can see I'm throwing this light. I think it's sort of sending it out across, like in a band across here, like this. Anyway, you can play for hours, like like I am doing now, and just um, kind of enjoy getting to. Uh, design your own 3D scene. I wanted to try one more thing, which is I've got my own color ramp, which I was well, not my own. I took it from uh, here. If you go to edit 
no not this one here if you go to uh, create new color ramp and then you choose CPT city and then you go uh, and take the topography bathymetry this is one of my favorite ones over here topo 15 lev catchy name and uh, nice to use so basically I've favorited that one and I've got it um, sitting in my in my collection of ramps so I'm going to just try switching to that one there and uh, seeing if I can make the scene look a little bit more realistic now that light is actually looks terrible <laughs> but um, uh, the blue I guess the blue is not helping is it so let's get change that blue to something more like a white light and um, the blue is good for like knowing whether we'd um, like where our light is actually shining I'll put a slight tint of yellow to it like this maybe like a bit of a sunset thing going on there let's try that now woohoo okay that, that's the bug again it's lost the cartography the fix for that we just uh, open and close that dialog again okay we're playing whack-a-mole with it with the bug but um, all right so anyway you get the idea of what you can do you can create some pretty interesting looking scenes um, I said I was going to try to just put some data over the top of that so um, I want to just go back to this here and I think this original one was my contours I'm just going to drop this here and have a look and see yep, that was the original contour lines now you may be wondering where are the contour lines you can't see them in the 3d view I'm going to hide them here uh, let's see so the problem is that those contours are beneath the map I suspect so if we go like this here um, oh, and I need to put them in 3d drawing mode first otherwise you wouldn't see them anyway so let's put them like that um, uh, and I find I have to normally tick this render a simple 3d, 3D lines box before you can see them so there they come in but they are um, unhelpfully all on a flat plane which is not going to be very useful is it so oopsie just got to get that back into view here quickly so what I want to do is I want to bring these contours onto the top of the map now to do that you need to either have the 3, 3D data um, already but if you look at these contours they are 2D contours I think um, let's look over here so we should see uh, Z in here to say it's multi-line string Z but it's not so I've got to drape them over the top of this elevation model now if it was um, a digital elevation map now there was a raster that I was using for the elevation the 3D support in QGIS would let me do that just straight out the box but the mesh doesn't yet let you do that so that means I've got to go and do a draping analysis or uh, you know algorithm to to uh, turn these into 3d shapes and to do that I need to have a dim so um, I need to basically turn my mesh into a dim is where I'm going with this so there's a plugin also from Lutra called crayfish and if you'll find it under the mesh menu here um, and um, let's see um, what it does sorry it's not going to be in there it's going to be added into the processing toolbox there we go mesh again here and you'll see there is going to be one which says um, export gridded value on mesh I think it's the one we want all right so we double click on that and now we're basically making a dem just so that I can assign elevation to my um, to my contours so I choose the input layers uh, the tin uh, the time step is because meshes can have time data in them as well so they can be multi-dimensional as I mentioned before the output data I'm going to put is Cartesian grid so XY and we're going to put it to a TIFF file in our folder quickly so 
Let me go find. Uh, save to file. Ah. Call it dem. Ah. It should hopefully be making a TIFF file. Oh no, it's making a shape file. So I think I've got the wrong tool. Um, let's just go look again quickly. Mesh. Um, I think we want to export the faces. Let me just check. No, that's what's going to make a vector layer. All right, I can't find the tool now. So I think I maybe wrap up here and then I'll come back another time and I'll show you how to um, convert this mesh to a DEM and then drape your contours over. That will be the nice topic for the next uh, Nerdvana show and tell. Anyway, I hope you got something useful out of this um, just watching me explore the mesh tools. Uh, there are a few quirks, as I've mentioned. That's the main reason I'm actually making this is to um, is to sort of mention some of those quirks because if you are um, not aware of them you might think things are not working but you actually just have to do stuff like coming in here and opening and closing the 3D um, options box before um, the view updates. But uh, if you don't mind working around a few quirks you've got actually a super powerful tool at your fingertips here in QGIS for uh, visualizing 3D scenes and um, yeah, bear in mind some of those limits. You can see my GPU is working very hard because it's you know I've got a million vertices in here. But I think if you um, you s do something a little bit less ambitious, you might have uh, a pretty good performance um, uh, with that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you want me to cover any specific topics or um, got any ideas for future future interviews or um, chats with developers or um, GIS QGIS experts, then please let me know. Uh, you can put some comments below or send me an uh, email at info at and we'll be happy to try to accommodate you. Thanks for watching.